Welcome everyone. My name is Jessica Chu and I am a member of the ICCT communications team. Thank you for joining us today. Our webinar will be about battery electric trucks and the most affordable path to decarbonize tractor trailers. Um, today's presentation will last approximately 20 minutes and afterward we will have an additional 15 to 20 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, we will keep this to a total of 45 minutes. And a couple of housekeeping items to begin with. Uh, this webinar is now being recorded. Uh, everybody's microphone is currently on mute. So if you have questions about the presentation, please uh, write them in the question block. And that's in the control panel at the right side of your screen. And we will be collecting these throughout the presentation and answer them during the Q&A session. Uh, so today's webinar was presented by our researcher Hussein Basma, but before we begin, I'll let Ray Minhares, ICCT's Director of Heavy Duty Vehicle Program, to introduce our presenter and give a brief overview of the topic. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to join you today for uh, the release of a study that um, we will be um, posting on our website today on a topic that I'm sure is of interest to all of you, uh, which is on what is the uh, least cost path to decarbonizing um, tractor trailers and specifically long haul tractors, which uh, according to ICT's estimates contribute, will contribute uh, about 67% uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions cumulatively through 2050. So that 67% number includes both short haul and long haul tractors, 50% uh, is just the long haul segment. And all of that to say that, the, that when we who work in this space are thinking about how we reach true decarbonization uh, of the transportation sector, it's critically important that we factor in this particular segment. Um, the Biden administration has endorsed the goal of uh, achieving 30% zero emission heavy duty vehicle sales in 2030 and 40% in 2040. Um, and we're today expecting some momentum uh, that supports those goals through a vote that the California Resources Board um, is going to take on an advanced clean fleets rule that would include uh, a proposed 100% uh, zero emission sales requirement uh, in 2036. So that provides the context for the discussion that we have today. And I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleague Hussein Basma. He's a researcher in our Berlin office and is an international expert in uh, estimating and modeling the total cost of ownership of heavy duty vehicles and was the lead author on, on the study that we're releasing today. So Hussein will present uh, the key findings from the study and will be available for our Q&A session. I'll continue to moderate. Um, so through the course of his presentation, please feel free to post any questions or comments that you have in uh, uh, on the right hand of your screen. Uh, and I will take those uh, when Hussein completes his, his presentation. So with that, uh, Hussein, I would like to hand it off to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, so yeah, this is Hussein from the ICCT. And as Ray mentioned, today we will be talking about the uh, economic effectiveness or the financial viability of alternative vehicle technologies, mainly focusing on tractor trailers operating uh, in, in the long haul in the US. Um, so first, why the long haul segment in specific? Uh, so as Ray mentioned, simply because um, tractors represent almost 30% of the total class four to eight population uh, of trucks in the United States. And long haul trucks, to be more specific, represent almost two thirds of the total tractor population. Um, in addition, tractor trailers operating uh, in long haul are considered among the most difficult segment to decarbonize given their long uh, travel distances and also their heavy payloads that they carry so which make it a very difficult vehicle segment to electrify um, when it comes to emissions as, as we mentioned so tractors in general are expected to emit almost 67 percent 
of the total greenhouse gas emissions of class four to class eight vehicles uh, through 2050. And almost 50% of, of those emissions will originate from combination long haul trucks. Um, so just to highlight the importance of decarbonizing this vehicle segment, while on the other hand, um, acknowledge the, the challenges uh, that would actually face the decarbonization of long haul trucks in the US. Um, and one of those, one of the main challenges is the economic viability of, of new technologies for long haul truck applications. And this is the main um, highlight of our presentation today. We will be talking about the total cost of ownership, TCO, of uh, several long haul truck tractor technologies and um, in order to comment on their financial viability. Um, so the TCO is, is, is one metric we use to comment on this financial viability of new technologies for trucks. And uh, as you can see in this slide, um, we are trying to be as comprehensive as possible when estimating the TCO. For example, we look at the retail price of the vehicle or the manufacturer suggested retail price, um, more, more of the capital investment. We definitely look at the fuel and energy cost, maintenance cost, labor, insurance, infrastructure, taxes, and payload losses for some technologies. There might be some payload capacity losses, so we monetize those losses and include them in the TCO analysis. Um, so the scope of this analysis covers actually four main technologies. Um, so we focus definitely on the baseline diesel truck uh, as our reference technology. We also look at two zero emission technologies, battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell trucks. And we take into account hydrogen combustion engine trucks, which is a technology that has been gaining some significant momentum, especially, especially in the US. Um, a couple of assumptions uh, regarding this analysis. So we're assuming a long haul case with an average daily mileage of 500 miles. Um, also, when it comes to the charging technology, we assume that most of the charging for the electric trucks will take place using publicly accessible uh, charging stations. Uh, we assume that today the trucks can be recharged with a 350 kW technology, but as of 2027, um, we believe that megawatt charging technology will be deployed at an acceptable coverage in the US. So uh, we can take that into account. Um, yeah, when it comes to the geographic scope of our analysis, uh, well, this TCO, usually TCO analysis uh, is location specific because it really depends on the location specific cost inputs like taxes, uh, energy prices, uh, and fuel prices. And for this sake, we considered seven representative states in, in, in the US. So starting from the east, we looked at trucks operating in New York, uh, Georgia, Florida, Illinois, Texas, California, and Washington. Um, the reasons behind choosing those states are mentioned in the slide. Uh, so for example, we are trying to ensure a comprehensive geographic coverage over the US mainland. We're also trying to focus on states with the highest long haul trucking activity. And also we looked at states that have differences in, in the commercial electricity rates because that would significantly impact the TCO of long haul trucks. So that being said, I will move now and talk about the main key findings of, of our analysis. Um, so first of all, our analysis have uh, concluded that battery electric trucks operating on long haul are expected to achieve the lowest total cost of ownership by the end of the decade for most truck applications. Um, so as you can see in the slide, we are showing the, uh, we are summarizing the TCO for um, different states and for different technologies. For every state, we're showing the four technologies that I've just mentioned. So diesel, battery electric, um, hydrogen fuel cell and also hydrogen combustion engines. And um, you can see that battery electric trucks are recording the lowest TCO in, in dollars per mile. Um, this is like two to seven, eight percent lower than the diesel truck TCO by 2030. Um, for both hydrogen powered trucks, so for hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen combustion trucks, uh, our analysis have shown a higher TCO significantly higher than um, battery electric and, and diesel trucks. 
Um, it is also interesting to, to highlight the TCO difference uh, among the different states. For example, in, in some states, the TCO in general is expected to be higher than other states, and this is normal due to the state-specific energy prices and fuel prices. But the trend is mainly, the general trend is the same. Battery electric trucks are the cheapest technology for most, for all considered states in, in this analysis. Um, in order to dig a little bit deeper and understand why are we achieving such, um, such results, um, yeah, if we have a zoom in at the TCO breakdown for trucks operating in California. So yeah, on the left-hand side, we have the TCO evolution uh, between 2022 all the way until 2040 for the four technologies. And you can see that almost by 2030, the TCO of the battery electric truck technology is is breaking even with, with that of, of diesel trucks. And if we look at the TCO breakdown, um, and we take this snapshot for a 2030 model year truck, uh, we can see that the biggest chunk of, of the TCO for the fuel cell and the hydrogen ICE trucks is mainly driven by the fuel cost. So this big chunk big red chunk of the bar is the is the fuel cost which is the hydrogen fuel cost for fuel cells and hydrogen engines so this is mainly driving the higher tco of, of those trucks and this is related to a couple of factors most importantly the fuel economy or energy efficiency of, of, of those technologies so uh, battery electric trucks are by far the most energy efficient technology they have the highest fuel economy while fuel cells and hydrogen internal combustion engines are not as efficient as battery electric trucks. And for long haul applications where trucks actually drive for very high uh, number of miles, the operational expenses or the fuel cost in this case will be a significant or will be the main driver behind the TCO. And this is the main reason why um, we have concluded that fuel cell trucks and hydrogen ICA trucks are actually more expensive from a TCO perspective. Um, yeah, so that being said, it's, it's also interesting to understand how different charging costs and also hydrogen prices will actually um, affect the economic viability of both zero emission uh, trucks, of both battery electric trucks and fuel cell trucks. Uh, so if we focus on the uh, figure on the left-hand side of the slide, so truck model year 2030, um, what I'm showing here is that uh, so we have the charging cost on the horizontal axis and we have the green hydrogen price on the vertical axis. And then we have a map and this map is obvious to split into two main regions. So we have the red region. This is a region where fuel cell trucks are cheaper and we have the green one, a region where battery electric trucks are cheaper. So, for example, uh, this map is telling us that for a certain combination of charging cost and green hydrogen price, we can tell which technology will be uh, the cheaper option. For example, if the charging cost is $0.3 per kilowatt hour or $0.30 cents per kilowatt hour, and the green hydrogen price is $7 per kilogram, this means that for this combination, battery electric trucks are the cheaper technology. And intuitively, if the charging cost is very high, then fuel cell trucks will be cheaper, or if hydrogen prices are really high, then battery electric trucks will be the preferred option from an economic perspective. Um, so if we project our expected charging costs and green hydrogen prices in the US by the end of the decade, um, we end up in this shaded region on, on the figure uh, because we expect that the charging cost in the US will range between 15 cents to 30 cents per kilowatt hour by 2030. Um, definitely, we have state uh, differences in terms of electricity prices. So that's why we have a, a wide range of charging costs. Same thing for hydrogen prices. We expect the green hydrogen price at the pump is going to range between $9 per kilogram and $11 per kilogram. So for those ranges of charging costs and green hydrogen prices, um, we obviously, we're obviously in an area where battery electric trucks are the cheaper technology. Um, Another interesting information that we can extract from, from this figure is, well, what is the break-even price between a battery electric truck and a fuel cell truck? Uh, so what is the hydrogen break-even price? 
And this is something we can just look at uh, from this figure. For example, uh, for a 15 cents per kilowatt hour charging cost, the green hydrogen price should be as low as $3 per kilogram so that fuel cells would break even with battery electric trucks from a TCO perspective. And definitely the higher the charging cost, the higher the break even price for fuel cell trucks uh, when it comes to the green hydrogen price at the pump. So that being said, um, the main message is that fuel and energy costs will definitely impact the TCO of, of both zero emission technologies. And given our own estimates on the expected charging cost and green hydrogen prices in the United States, uh, we expect that battery electric trucks are going to be the cheaper zero emission technology from a TCO perspective. I still have one last slide uh, from the main findings. Um, so yeah, this is about the impact of the uh, truck uh, mileage on, on its TCO. So uh, we already know that um, battery electric trucks are equipped with, with batteries and those batteries can be really massive, uh, which would affect the cost. And the battery sizing is mainly driven by the average daily mileage of, of, the, of, of, the, of the truck. And, um, and that would have a significant impact on the TCO. But I would like to highlight um, two main concepts or two main metrics, actually, the average daily mileage and the mileage variability. So the average daily mileage of a truck is, is, is self-descriptive. So just how many miles on average the truck is driving per day. But the mileage variability is, is more reflective of the worst case scenario for uh, in terms of daily mileage of the truck. And usually fleets are, would actually size their batteries to meet the worst case scenario. So if the, if the average daily mileage is high, this means that the truck needs bigger battery, which, is a, uh, which would have a negative impact on the TCO. But on the other hand, this also means more miles. The truck is being driven for more miles. And for battery electric trucks, the more they drive, the more their benefits that they can accumulate relative to diesel, because they have lower operational expenses per mile, they require lower maintenance costs, and also their uh, fuel cost per mile is lower than diesel. So we have a trade-off here when it comes to the average daily mileage. Um, but when it comes to the daily mileage variability, um, actually, the higher the variability, the bigger the battery size, and that would have a negative impact um, on, the, uh, on the TCO. So uh, the main message here is that we have done this analysis, assessing the impact of the average daily mileage and mileage variability on the TCO, and our analysis have concluded that battery electric tr trucks would still achieve a better TCO than diesel, even for very high, or let's say even for high daily mileages on average, assuming that their day-to-day -day mileage variability is low. Um, so with that being said, this is my final slide. I do have so many additional slides, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Ray to take some questions and probably dig deeper into some aspects of the analysis. Okay, thank you so much, Hussein. And we've been getting some questions. So um, wonderful to see those highlights and to get the high level messages from the study. Um, so uh, we're gonna transition now to just a, a, a Q&A uh, and I've been collecting some of the questions from, from our audience. So I wanted to start Hussein with just a question about this concept of megawatt charging, right? So here we're talking about uh, you know, um, significantly higher uh, charging capacity than what we're seeing with passenger vehicles. And so, um, uh, you know, what can you tell us about uh, the the role of megawatt charging in uh, the overall system uh, of battery electric trucks? Why is megawatt charging important? And, you know, in addition, if you could explain your underlying assumptions, including the availability of megawatt charging in 2027 and the price of the electricity. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ray. Um, so definitely one of the challenges facing any battery electric vehicle is, is its driving range and refueling time, um, if we compare that to diesel or other technologies. So with the, with the deployment of megawatt charging, battery electric trucks would have the, uh, the option to, to recharge pretty quickly. Uh, just to give some example, um, for long-haul trucks, the drivers usually have a mandatory break during 
the daily operation, it could range between 30 minutes to one hour. So if the driver is, is using this brake to, to recharge the truck at one megawatt, this will easily provide 100 to 150 miles, in some cases even more than that, uh, of additional daily mileage. So this will extend the, um, the, mile, the driving range of the truck. So that's one. Uh, on the other hand, um, with megawatt charging being deployed at, a, at an acceptable geographic coverage, let's say, um, the sizing of the batteries for long haul trucks in specific uh, could, would change because we could size the batteries to meet a lower uh, driving range since we have the capacity to recharge during the day. And this means a smaller battery and the smaller battery means a cheaper truck from a retail price perspective, um, lower energy consumption because we have a lighter battery and also more payload capacity. Um, on the other question regarding the, um, the, the uh, impact on the charging cost, um, yeah, we have looked into that in, in detail um, because, and I can show some slides in here. Um, yeah, with the deployment of megawatt charging, um, we do expect some significant uh, grid upgrades and these could be really expensive. And in order to take that into account, we have actually um, conducted a bottom-up approach to, to quantify the charging cost of a megawatt charging station. So we're dealing with a 20 megawatt public charging station um, and we look at the electricity cost, the energy charges, demand charges. Uh, so pretty much the typical cost components that you would see on your monthly electricity bill. But I would say the challenge is to quantify the cost from the infrastructure side. So while the chargers costs uh, are actually, um, is, is, is an available information to get such as what is the cost of one megawatt charger, um, the challenge is to quantify the grid connection costs. And that's what we've been doing over the past couple of months in collaboration with, with ICCT's um, consultants and in collaboration with, with a couple of local utilities or distribution system operators in the States. And we, we were able to get some cost estimates for the um, grid connections and the whole infrastructure ecosystem for a typical megawatt charging stations in the US taking into account costs related to transmission, upgrade, distribution, um, and also transformers um, that, would need, that would need to be uh, deployed at, on, on site or in different locations. So we take all that into account and we estimate the total cost of infrastructure, including grid upgrades uh, in the US, and we validate our assumptions with local utilities. And as, as I was showing in, in one of the slides, we end up estimating the charging cost of a typical megawatt charging station um, and as you can see the cost would range anywhere between 15 cents per kilowatt hour or maybe 16 in the case of texas and it can be as high as 30 cents per kilowatt hour in, in california for example but given these charging costs battery electric trucks were still capable of achieving a tco parity with diesel and recording the lowest tco relative to all other technologies Thanks for showing all of those assumptions, Hussein. And I think it shows, you know, the richness of data that went into supporting this analysis that, you know, I haven't seen any study that's really done a true bottoms up uh, like this, you know, where, you know, they, you know, in our case, you know, you and, and others on our team uh, spoke to utilities directly and validated some of these assumptions with them. So, this isn't a surprise to them. This is reflective of what their current rates are, and I think is um, a realistic expectation of what you know uh, fleets uh, would be paying. And I think it's also just very interesting to see the you know range of prices across states in the U.S. and the extent to which states like Texas and Florida, for example, are providing some of the cheapest electricity rates despite the fact that they're not requiring the sale of electric trucks or the purchase of electric trucks to the extent that a state like California is. So it, it, it suggests the, the real potential for growth uh, of this sector and the real, um, let's say, the this, this strong business case that exists for investing in battery electric tractors in states beyond just those that are at this point uh, actually regulating 
uh, the sale and purchase of electric trucks. Um, so I think all of that is great. And I wanted to kind of connect this discussion uh, to kind of this question, and you hinted at it a little bit in your in your answer of, you know, what is, why it is important that this type of charging, this this higher capacity charging be available. You know, one one comment that we often hear is that only fuel cell tractors can deliver diesel equivalent performance. Uh, and that tends to focus on the refueling time. And obviously megawatt charging is a response to that, but it seems like um, there is this trade-off between the availability of megawatt charging and the size of the batteries. So can you just say a little bit more about that trade-off and how significant it is to have this higher capacity charging available and what it would mean if it weren't available for this segment? Yeah, yeah thank you, Ray. So exactly. So let me yeah, show this slide. Um, so when it comes to the trade-off between uh, megawatt charging and, and battery size, so usually if we have the option to charge at a megawatt capacity during the day, this means that we can have a smaller battery. And as I mentioned, a smaller battery is, is usually a um, uh, less expensive battery. Uh, but also from the other side, from the performance of the truck, uh, a smaller battery means more payload capacity for the trucks. Um, so, for example, uh, if we look at this figure um, for the current technology 2022, let's say 2023, uh, we're assuming that trucks can only be recharged using 350 kW uh, charging technology, which means that the battery should really be, let's say, bigger in this case to be able to, to, be able to supply the truck daily energy needs and daily miles. And this would have an impact on the payload capacity of the truck. And if we compare the payload capacity, you know, this, this, the blue labels in this figure, it is almost 10,000 pounds lower than that of a, of a diesel equivalent truck. But for future technologies, when we expect the deployment of megawatt charging stations, um, batteries can be significantly downsized. And thus, smaller batteries mean lighter batteries, and the payload capacity of a battery electric truck would be comparable to that of a diesel truck and other technologies. So uh, in terms of performance, the rollout of megawatt charging stations would have a significant impact on the performance of the truck, uh, not only from so not only from the cost uh, aspect of, of this analysis, but also from other technical and operational aspects such as payload capacity and refueling time. Wonderful, uh, thanks for that. And I think um, given the the, the, the key importance, I think, of this infrastructure to enable the smaller batteries and this battery electric solution, I, I just want to put a plug in here now for a study that ICT will be releasing uh, hopefully in the next week or so on the infrastructure needs to support a zero emission transition for the medium and heavy duty sector. And so we'll be putting some specific numbers on where, when, and how much charging would be required across the country down to the county scale. Uh, and that will include how many megawatt chargers uh, in addition to these uh, fast 350 kilowatt and then overnight chargers, which are down to maybe 100 kilowatt chargers. So just want to put a plug in now for folks that are going to be interested in and how how that how we tell that story. And I think this study is helping to kind of set the context for that infrastructure discussion that I think is already, you know, coming to the forefront and that people are asking questions about. I also want to call attention to, you know, this this timing aspect and the investments that are already being made in that infrastructure availability. And we're seeing, uh, you know, certain truck manufacturers, uh, the one that comes to mind is Daimler Trucks North America, which has established a joint venture with BlackRock and Next Era Energy to build out charging infrastructure for battery electric trucks. Um, there's also uh, a number of new players emerging in the space, especially around charging as a service. And you know, many of those are getting their start in California because of the incentives and because of the policy 
environment that's that's supporting those investments and bringing certainty to those investments. So a couple of companies that come to mind include Forum Mobility, um, Watt EV is another one, um, and you know we're also learning about a group called Terawatt Infrastructure, uh, which has already announced uh, uh, its intent to build a um, a fast charging network from the port of Long Beach in Southern California to El Paso, Texas. That's about an 800 mile segment that would uh, be an example of an electric truck corridor. And I'm hopeful that uh, more announcements uh, and that more such corridors are on the radar of these and other companies that see the, the strong business case that is already being presented here through ICT analysis in favor of um, battery electric tractors. Um, so we don't have too much more to go here. Uh, we did get a couple of other questions, really more on the on the kind of policy space. Um, we did have a question about um, kind of what the um, difference is between policies that are supportive of truck electrification, both in California and also at the federal level. So in California, there is the advanced clean trucks rule, which requires the sale of zero emission trucks from class two, B and three, all the way up to class eight, which are the heaviest category of trucks. And we also um, have just uh, recently seen the US EPA bring forward a proposal for new greenhouse gas standards for um, heavy duty vehicles, which won't necessarily require the sale, but would act, would actually still nevertheless reinforce and support the shift towards electrification through limits on the CO2 emissions on the fleet average scale for those vehicles. And some of those limits would be only achievable by deploying zero emission vehicles. And so I actually pulled up a few numbers while you were talking, Hussein, just for those who are interested in, you know, the kind of stringency and the relative direction that California policy and federal policy are going here. Um, and so if we take, for example, the category of vocational trucks, um, in 2030, uh, the state of California requires 50% of all vocational trucks to be uh, sold as zero emission trucks. Uh, and the EPA in their most recent phase three proposal is targeting a level of around 30 percent and again it's not a proposal that would require zero emission truck sales at the federal level but would set a co2 standard that is in line with an assumed 30 percent zero emission uh, truck deployment with tractors which is what we've been talking about today um, california in 2030 is at about a 30 percent um, level for zero emission tractor sales uh, US EPA would be somewhere around 14%. So that gives you a sense for the relative levels of ambition that we're currently seeing coming through these different um, uh, jurisdictions uh, and the extent to which um, we're seeing California uh, setting more stringent targets uh, that other states are, are, are following. And so we have now, I believe, at least six states uh, that have adopted California's Advanced Clean Trucks program and others that have stated their intent to do the same. Um, so uh, we also had a question about the extent to which uh, federal and, and, and California policies might be supporting um, hydrogen versus uh, battery electric. And um, I think it's pretty clear from my perspective that um, both jurisdictions are following a technology neutral pathway, at least with respect to the vehicle standards. That doesn't necessarily speak to, you know, incentives uh, that might be available either for the vehicle or for the fuel. But at least when it comes to what manufacturers are required to sell in California, uh, there is a, a per technology neutral requirement. So manufacturers can choose any zero emission pathway to meet the requirements in California. And that would still be the case at, for a federal greenhouse gas standard, which would be regulating simply the CO2 emissions and not necessarily requiring uh, any particular technology pathway there. Um, so 
those are a couple of questions that I wanted to make sure we covered here. Um, just taking a quick look to see if we have anything more um, uh, to cover here. I'm not really seeing uh, much else. I think um, we can probably bring this to a close here, Pierre. Um, uh, you know, for those who would like to have access to these slides, they will be posted to our website where you um, would have registered for this webinar. Uh, and also there will be a full recording of this webinar that will be made publicly available. So I think with that, uh, Jessica, I'd perhaps hand it back to you if you wanted to ha have any closing remarks um, and other housekeeping things for folks. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Uh, we wanted to thank you to everyone for participating in today's webinar. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any further questions. Uh, you have Ray and uh, Hussein's contact here. Their emails are on the screen. Uh, remember to follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter. Our handle is at T-H-E-I-C-C-T. Uh, and then thanks again. We hope to see you soon. Have a good rest of your day and then we'll see you next time. Thanks all. Bye for now.